Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the session, and thanks for coming. My name is Madi. I'm a software engineer at SignalFX, and today I'm going to cover how we scale and operate Elasticsearch at SignalFX. What you should expect from the session is four uh, main topics. One, we'll talk about how we use Elasticsearch at SignalFX. Two, we're going to talk about the important metrics and important alerts that you need to worry about. Three, we're going to talk about Elasticsearch capacity planning. And the last topic is about how we do zero downtime resharding of Elasticsearch. I'll cover a little bit of the Elasticsearch basics if, if some of the audience is not familiar with Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch at SignalFX, um, first, uh, I want to clarify that this is not the Amazon Elasticsearch service. This is basically us, SignalFX, deploying Elasticsearch on top of EC2. SignalFX is a cloud uh, monitoring solution. And as part of ingesting a ton of metrics into the system, we have to make them available for search. And that's what Elasticsearch comes into play. We use it for three main use cases. One is being able to run ad hoc queries against the data. We should be able to find um, a metric by the metric name, by properties on the metrics, et cetera. The second use case is we use it for auto-suggestion, so people can type, and as they type, things are being suggested. And that's being driven by Elasticsearch in the back end. And our third, third use case is obviously the full text search. Um, you type, for example, here, the word watch, and you get things that include the word watch um, in the results. The clusters that we have in productions, we actually have four of them. Um, I'm just going to focus on the biggest one because that's the most interesting. It's a 54 data nodes, uh, three master nodes, six, six client nodes. Uh, they're all deployed across three availability zones. Um, we have over 1.3, I think by last week it was 1.5 billion unique documents in the system. Uh, we have 10 plus terabyte of data. This is only the primaries. If you include the replicas, that jumps to 30 terabyte. Uh, we have about 270 shards in the system. This includes primaries and replicas. And we do sustained uh, 75 query per second. This is queries coming from our services. Uh, the cluster itself, because it has so many number of shards, handles about 3,000 queries per second. And um, usually, uh, sustained load is 1,000 indexing operation per second. And we do spike to 3,000, sometimes five or 6,000 indexing operation per second. The way we deploy this on AWS, one, we use Docker. Um, it's, it makes everything easier from a kind of development, development and production standpoint. So what you do in development is very similar to what you do in, in production. We, we've been using Docker since day one. It, it made things a lot easier. We use a mix of Elasticsearch versions 2.3, uh, 3, and 1.75. Uh, we've been trying to migrate everything to, to the 2.x release. It's, it's a lot much better. Uh, we orchestrate all these Docker containers using a open source framework called uh, Maestro NG. It was written by one of our engineers. Um, our biggest cluster um, in terms of the machine types we use, for the data nodes, we use i2.2x large nodes. Uh, these come with 61 gigs of memory. We do use only uh, 16 gigs. In the past, we've been running with 31 gigs of memory. And we noticed when we reduced to 16 gigs, there were performance improvement. And most of these performance improvements were due to the um, smaller garbage collections that happen uh, when ES needs to allocate more memory. Uh, for the master nodes, these are stateless nodes. They don't, they don't have to be that powerful. We use n3.large. We allocate two uh, gigabytes to, uh, to the JVM heap. And the client nodes are a little bit uh, beefier. Uh, these are also stateless machines. And we use m3.xlarge with 10 gigs of heap. One thing that's, that's, that we, we found out by experience is that it's, it turned out to be a very good decision to split these into different tiers. Uh, by default, when you install Elasticsearch, all these different responsibilities end up being on the same nodes. And that's fine for development and staging. But once, when you, once you go to production, it becomes a completely different story. For example, you definitely don't want your master nodes to be on your data nodes, because if, you're, if you have uh, JVM thrashing in, uh, the system is, is, is basically trying to get CPU. It's not going to be able to get CPU. And then anything that's related to uh, heartbeat of the master is not going to make it in time. And you, you're going to have all sorts of issues when that happens. So definitely split the master nodes into dedicated machines. Usually, you should put them on either three or five machines. 
and uh, configure the cluster to uh, only elect a master if there is a quorum, which is very, a very important setting. And then the client nodes are, are also as important because they act as a fuse for the system. You don't want to lose any data nodes because data nodes hold the data. And if you lose one and you have to restart it, it's going to have to sync up the data again, which is a very intensive uh, from an I.O. perspective or CPU perspective operation. So you want to have client nodes uh, isolate the system as much as you can. So if something goes bad, it's going to go bad on the client nodes, and the client nodes will crash, for example. And since they're stateless, you just restart them, and it's fine. Another thing nice about the client nodes is that they're aware of the um, rack distribution of the data nodes. So if you talk to um, a, a client node in AZ1, um, it's going to talk to data nodes in the same AZ, and obviously, if those are not available, it's, it's going to go to, to other nodes in, in other AZs, but the preference is to the same AZ, which makes uh, latency better. It also avoids uh, costly cross-AZ uh, traffic. Um, we deploy this across three availability zones. Um, we use basically ES rack awareness to do this, so you have one, one primary and two replicas, one in each AZ, so you can, you can completely lose um, an AZ and still have access to your data. Backup restore, uh, very important. Uh, you definitely want to have this. If something bad happens, you should be able to restore your data. Uh, we use the AWS Cloud plugin. It's, it's very easy to use, actually. You just need uh, to, set up, um, to set it up. We uh, back up to S3. Uh, we do incremental backups. It's supported by default by the plugin. Uh, we use an, S, uh, an inversion S3 bucket. Uh, the reason we, we went for inversion is, is because of a bug in the AWS Cloud plugin um, that when you have a lot, a lot of versions, the plugin actually tries to fetch all those versions and will usually time out um, as, as you have more and more incremental backups. So we, we turned off versioning. We would love to turn it back on because if you have versioning enabled on your S3 bucket, um, one of the features of S3 is you can actually do cross-region replication, so you can have a copy of your, of your backup in a, in a completely different region for disaster recovery purposes. Uh, we do use also um, a dedicated VPC S3 endpoint. Uh, this allows us to channel the backup traffic into a single endpoint instead of putting it on, on the same VPC with all the other services. Uh, usually the backups are pretty heavy and they do consume bandwidth. Um, we also use instance profiles for authentication to S3, so you don't have to uh, store any username or password. This, this works really nicely. And for the frequency of running the backups, um, obviously this depends on, on, on your use case, but in ours we do, uh, we have a cron job that does a snapshot every hour, and then we rotate the backups on a weekly basis. Okay, so let's, let's jump to how we monitor and alert um, on Elasticsearch. So this is one of the dashboards that I usually would like uh, to look at, and it has what I think are the key metrics that we usually care about. And our, uh, for our use case, CPU load was uh, one of the most problematic areas. We were always having CPU spikes and queries that can, that can spike um, resources on the system. So CPU was one of our top thing to watch in the system. And obviously, it could be I.O. if you are like very indexing heavy. It could be anything else. But for us, it was CPU. So we do watch CPU on the data nodes. Uh, that's that's on, the, uh, on the left side. And then uh, we do watch it on, on the client nodes. It's usually a lot much uh, smaller. There are some spikes due to the queries. And you see that so spikes correlate with the spikes on the data node. The master nodes are usually not, not very spiky. Um, I think the spikes there are, are actually unrelated to Elasticsearch. And then uh, what we watch next is the queries coming into the system. So we do monitor the queries on both sides. Uh, one is on the client side, which is the services that actually access Elasticsearch, and the other side is on Elasticsearch itself. Um, the good thing about monitoring this on the client side is that you're able to determine by service which service is actually sending query to your Elasticsearch cluster, which is useful if you have a spike in traffic and you need to figure out uh, where those queries are coming from. And then we obviously watch the queries on the Elasticsearch side, and we expect, uh, as you can see here, it's, it's about 3,000 or 3,700 uh, queries per second across the whole cluster. And um, we also watch the indexing requests. Uh, we do about uh, 3,000 in this case. And then um, after that, what we, we want to watch is the merging that's going on. Uh, behind the scenes. As you know, Elasticsearch uses 
uh, Lucene underneath, and Lucene keeps its, its data unchanged. So when you update or delete a document, you're actually not updating it in place. You're changing a Lucene segment. Um, you're actually adding more data to a Lucene segment. You're never changing a Lucene segment. And at some point, you're gonna have so many Lucene segments that your search performance is gonna get impacted. So what Lucene does behind the scenes is merge these Lucene segments into a single, into a single segment. And that merge operation is, is very IO and CPU intensive, so we usually keep an eye on it. And if we see a CPU and spike, if you see, if you see a spike in CPU, we're, we're usually either able to correlate it to a spike in queries, to a spike in indexing, or to a spike in, in, in merging going on in the system. So this is kind of the happy face uh, of the equation. Uh, we usually look at this dashboard pretty much every day just to, to make sure things are looking sane. But it's very important that you have a detection system that allows you to figure out when things are not going as usual. And for this, what we usually focus on is high CPU usage and obviously low disk space. You definitely don't want to run out of disk space. Um, definitely don't want to run out of disk space. Don't do that. Um, sustained high heap usage. Um, sometimes the queries will, will, for example, if you have an aggregation and that aggregation has a high cardinality field, you're going to consume a ton of memory. And when that happens, you're going to see uh, your heap stay at, say, 80% for a very long period of time, and that's a bad sign. Uh, because if you get another query like that, your, your system is going to die with an OOM, with an out-of-memory exception, and that's not good. So you want to alert and, and, and have someone take a look at that when it happens. Uh, master nodes availability is very important because uh, since we set up the cluster with a quorum number of uh, eligible masters, if we lose one master node, uh, we're still okay, but we, if we lose another one, we're in trouble. So usually if we lose one master node, we wake up somebody to, to, start, to start another, another instance. The cluster state, uh, green, yellow, red, uh, very clear what's going on. Uh, yellow is kind of in a mid state. It, it could be completely fine. Um, what we like to do in this case is instead of um, watching directly the yellow state, we watch our SLAs. So in terms of queries, we would like our queries to stay within 100 milliseconds. So the cluster could be yellow, but as long as we're still within 100 milliseconds of query uh, latency, we're completely okay. We don't, we don't have to wake up somebody if it's like 2 a.m to fix the problem and bring up another node, but we will deal with it in the morning. If the SLA goes down uh, while losing machines, then uh, we would like somebody to, to take a look at it. And this gets a little bit more complicated with an assigned shards because you lose a machine and then the machine may come back and Elasticsearch is gonna reassign the shards. Uh, that's usually what's, what happens, but if it does not, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna have an assigned uh, shards that will stick around for a long time and we do have an alert. And we know like based on how, how much time it takes us to recover a node. Uh, it takes us about an hour to recover a node. Um, so if we see an assigned chart for more than an hour and a half, we know that um, we, have, we have to add capacity, basically, and that's when we wake up somebody. The last one that we think is very important is the thread pool rejections. So the way Elasticsearch deals with load, um, it basically, uh, for things like search, it has a thread pool which has a fixed number of threads. These are the threads that will do the search. And then in front of that thread pool, it has a queue. And that queue has a fixed size. And at some point, uh, as you're piling up more search requests against the cluster, if the system is not able to uh, deal with those requests fast enough, uh, those requests will end up being in the queue. And once the queue reaches a certain size, um, which is the, si the limit of the queue, Elasticsearch is basically gonna start protecting itself and saying, I cannot, I cannot run this request anymore. And when you see that, it's, it's usually an indication that you're either running out of capacity, like your system is, is growing, and you're running a lot more requests, and the system just cannot handle it. That's, uh, that's uh, number one. Number two is you may have a bad service, like somebody write a, wrote a loop, and that loop is just hitting your cluster from like 50 or 60 threads. And it's basically taken, uh, causing Elasticsearch to do, to do those, those rejections. So you wanna be able to identify and, and react to that uh, pretty quickly. Uh, one thing that's also we found uh, extremely important is to be able to uh, test your detectors and alerts. So when you set up an alert, usually what you will do is you will use tribal knowledge. Um, like we know my, our queries per second doesn't usually go beyond, beyond 10,000 per second, so I'm gonna set an alert uh, based on that. But most of the time what's gonna happen is um, you will get an alert at 2 a.m. and you figure out, oh, like 10,000, that, that's probably okay, like maybe it's 15,000. And you kind of keep tuning the system over and over again, and if you have uh, an ops team, the ops team will get upset about this. So a good thing to have uh, is to be able to 
simulate based on historical data if an, if an alert will actually fire or not, so that you know if, 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 if your alert is good enough. Okay, let's talk about capacity planning. Uh, this is one of those areas that a lot of people say is black magic. Um, it's actually a pretty, a pretty hard thing to, to figure out, so we'll, we'll try to kind of entangle it a little bit. So there are two things to think about from a capacity perspective for Elasticsearch, and they're obviously indexing and queries. So indexing is, is mostly CPU and I.O. intensive because you're getting document. Uh, you need to do tokenization. If you're using like crazy engrams and stuff like that, then that's going to be expensive. And then eventually you need to put things on disk that causes I.O. load on the system. And while this is happening, um, you could have merges that happen in the background. The problem with merges is that you don't actually control them. You don't control when they happen. Uh, this used to be really bad in the previous versions of, of Elasticsearch uh, 1.x, basically. Uh, there, there were a lot of knobs that you can tune to control this, but it was manual. And in 2.x, uh, this completely changed. So Lucene has this concept of uh, adaptive uh, merging, which basically tried to spread the merging load over a, a longer period of time by throttling uh, the I.O. and CPU consumption. And that makes those merged, merges a lot more smoother from a resource perspective, which is, which is pretty nice. Um, so if you have an option, don't, don't use anything uh, less than 2.x. Uh, queries is the other side of the beast. Um, and this is actually depends on, on your use case. So some use cases are very query intensive and there's not much indexing going on. Other use cases are very indexing heavy and uh, less number of queries. Our use case is both. We get, we get both sides. We have steady indexing load and we have steady query load, which is a little bit problematic. So for queries, what we have seen in our case is mostly CPU load and memory load. And usually the CPU load is coming either from expensive queries that have to load a, to, to load a lot of stuff into the heap, and um, also the garbage collection pressure on the system. This is a JVM system, so garbage collection is going to consume CPU, and you want to keep that below 5% of your total CPU consumption. So it's another thing um, to keep in mind. So the next question that comes into place is, Elasticsearch is elastic. So how can you deal with capacity problems um, since you have an elastic system, you can easily add nodes and scale up the cluster uh, that way. Um, that's very easily said, but in practice, there are a couple issues. So just to explain, um, in Elasticsearch, the data is partitioned, and each of one of these partitions is basically called shard in Elasticsearch terms. And uh, you have a number of primary shards, so you can say, I want my data to be split into two primary shards. And then you can create as many replicas as you want. So uh, on your left, we have a system with two nodes, two primary shards, and um, one replica set, basically. So you have two shards that are replicas. So in this case, you have two shards running on each node. So say your system is, not, is now running close to 70% CPU, and you'd like to keep that under 50% to allow for some growth. So what you do is very easily you spin up to extra, to extra nodes, Elasticsearch is going to automatically move some of the shards across the nodes, and now you kind of doubled your capacity immediately, and you will see technically your CPU load go down from 70% to something close to 30 or 35%, which is pretty nice. Um, but say that after a couple of months, you're back to the same problem. It's running at 70%. So what do you do now? Um, so there are a couple of options in how to deal with this. Uh, one of them is to add more replicas. Um, if you had another replica set, you can add more machines and move those replica sets to those machines. However, this is only going to help with the query load. If your problem is not query uh, load, if it's indexing, then you're pretty much stuck because all these shards would have to do exactly the same amount of work for indexing. So if your indexing is the guy who's consuming 50 or 60% of your CPU, you're going to hit the wall at some point, and you cannot index uh, fast enough. So this kind of brings the question is, the, the, the question that, that gets brought up here is, how do I pick up the right number of primary shards? In this case, I pick two, but why didn't I pick six? Why didn't I pick a thousand? Like what, how should I pick this number? One thing that I probably didn't mention is that once you pick this number, you cannot change it anymore. You can just 
increase it and expect things to work. It, it doesn't, you cannot do that. So that's a decision that you have to make upfront. Um, there, it, it really depends on the use case. Um, I'll talk about how we dealt with this, but this is one of the recommendations that, that you will find um, people talking about. So you create an index with one shard, um, you simulate what you expect your indexing load to be, and you observe what's the impact on CPU and IO, and you, you find where it breaks. Where it breaks depend on you. Um, maybe you want it to stay within 50%, and for you that's, that's basically where it breaks because you don't want to consume more than 50% to over-allocate for future growth. And then you do the same thing with queries. And why this is hard is sometimes when you start up your company or when you build your Elasticsearch cluster, you actually still don't know how the indexing is going to look like. You don't know how the queries are going to look like. And even if you guess, uh, you may end up with a completely wrong guess. And um, this is what basically pushed us to come with this uh, mechanism of resharding Elasticsearch, basically allowing us to change the number of primary shards without having any downtime. And that's uh, what we're going to talk about. And obviously, something I forgot to mention here, this consumption, this one is, is one of the easiest to figure out. Um, if you can um, uh, populate your index with documents that you think are representative of your data set, you just need to extrapolate your average document size and uh, figure out how, much, how, how many documents you can store, basically. Uh, storage has been something that's, that's actually easy to, to, uh, to capacity plan for. But when you combine all these things, storage, plus uh, CPU, plus I.O. You also have to pick an instance type. Um, you have to pick how much memory you're going to allocate to the JVM. It gets, it gets a little bit complicated, but everything is measurable, uh, and, and, that, and that's why you want to try these things and adjust things as you build up your system. And for signal effects, what we ended up doing when we started this, we made some back of the envelope calculation. We figured out that we will be okay for six shots, and three months later, we had 18 nodes, with three, uh, with with six shards and 18 replica, and sorry, 12 replicas, and we were at capacity. We couldn't add more capacity, so we were basically stuck, and the cluster was running hot all the time. And this is where the next section comes into play: is how do you actually do this this resharding without um, taking the system down? So, resharding is usually useful for the example that I mentioned, being able to change your number of primary shards from say six shards to 12 or 18 or whatever. Um, it's also important if, if you want to change your mapping file. So say you had a field and you didn't enable dog values on that field, and that was a mistake, and you want to fix it. Today you cannot fix it. I mean, you can, you can technically fix it by creating a new field with a different name and kind of doing all that migration magic, um, backward compatibility, plus minus one compatibility, et cetera. Um, but if you have a large number of these changes that you need to make over time, for example, at some point when we were running uh, 1.4, we were not using dog values at all. And we wanted to switch to dog values because dog values bring huge improvement in terms of CPU and memory consumption. So we had to do, even, even though we didn't have to do a reshard, like the, the, the number of shards were, was the same, but we had to do the mapping without any downtime. Um, the couple of solutions to this problem, if your indexing is, is read-only, you're in paradise. That's, that's awesome. It's like, that's the most beautiful thing. It's immutable, does not change. Um, you can just use aliases, point the alias to the current index, uh, copy everything to a new index, nothing is changing, so no race condition, nothing. It's awesome. Um, if it's not like us, then you're, you're in trouble land. So how do you deal with that? So, before we jump into that, I'd like to go through our uh, metadata storage architecture. I think it's important to this discussion. Um, so the, we have, at a very high level, these are the main components. We have services in the system. These services have a library that we call the Metabase client. Um, there is Kafka that allows us to queue things. Uh, we have a component called Metabase. This is basically the, pi the data pipeline. And we have Cassandra as our main source of truth and Elasticsearch. Um, as our search index. So we'll follow a, uh, a write to the system. So number one is we enqueue uh, what we call a write command that gets enqueued on the write topic. It's get, it gets pulled by one of the metabase instances. Then we basically write it into Cassandra. And then what we do is we enqueue an indexing command on the index topic. The indexing command is pretty much the ID of the document that we just wrote to Cassandra, and that's pretty much it. And then one of the metabase instances will, 
will pull from the indexing topic. Right now, it's, it's the same tier, but eventually we'll split those into a Cassandra write tier and, and an ES indexing tier. And then what we do is we read the document from Cassandra, and then we put it into Elasticsearch. Uh, when we implemented this, Elasticsearch did not have support for incremental updates, uh, so we had to pull uh, the data from Cassandra again. Um, our system allows incremental writes, so the service, when it enqueues a write, it enqueues an incremental write. That's why we have to also fetch the document from Cassandra. It's actually turned to be a pretty nice thing because since Cassandra is the source of truth, uh, we can actually reorder things on the indexing topic because the source of truth does not uh, halt, halts the data, basically. And then once we read it from uh, Cassandra, we index it into Elasticsearch. So there are a couple things about this architecture. Uh, one is the queuing aspect, and this is awesome because um, it allows you to completely decouple Cassandra from Elasticsearch. And what you can do as well, uh, you can put throttling controls on your indexing. So if you're okay with indexing being behind by, say, 10 seconds or 15 seconds, then you can tune down your um, indexing load to avoid um, loading up the system, basically. Uh, and having Kafka in the middle allows you to do this pretty easily. So how does this resharding process work? So we'll go through um, the phases uh, of, this, of this operation. For the prerequisites, this is what we require to do this. We, we require all uh, services that are querying Elasticsearch to query against an alias. They never know what the index name and they shouldn't care. So in this case, we have an, an alias called myindex. That alias is pointing uh, to the actual index name and you notice the underscore v1, which is the version of the index. From the client perspective, this does not matter. Prerequisite number two is we maintain an indexing state the indexing state is used by the metabase component that's responsible for indexing the data into Elasticsearch. We only have one component that can write to Elasticsearch. And the indexing state contains three, bit, three bits of information. One, what is the current index name? And notice this is the index name, not the alias. Two, uh, what is the generation number of the index? The generation number uh, is something that we add to every document that we write to Elasticsearch, and this generation number is what allows us to do this and handle concurrency at the same time, and that's what I'm gonna cover in the next slides. To start the migration, you obviously have to create the new index. Say you had six shards in the past, now you create the, the new index with 18 shards. You change your mappings, you did all the good stuff that you wanted to do, you're ready to go. The first step you do is you bump up the generation number. When you bump up the generation number, what you're basically doing is any incoming index operation after the uh, generation number has been changed is gonna have generation number 43. What practically that means is that anything that's less or equal than 42 is a fixed set. It's, sorry, it's a bounded set. It's not gonna increase. It's only gonna decrease. Uh, so if you add a new document, it does not get impacted. If you update an existing document, that document, say, had version five, now that version is gonna get bumped to version 43. And while this is happening, what you can do is you can do a scroll migration of documents of generation less or equal than 42. And since that set is, is bounded, then you're not tracing with anybody. And then while this is happening, the system is changing, which is the difficulty in how, in how you deal with this. So you get new stuff uh, that gets added, you get new stuff that gets updated, and at the end of the, what we call the bulk indexing phase, what you end up with is two different indices, which is expected because things are changing while you're migrating. So now what you need to do is somehow reconcile those indices and because you have this generation number, that makes the reconciliation very easy. So what you do in this case, you bump up the generation one more time from 43 to 44 and then what you have to do to reconcile the system, and uh, sorry, one, one very important thing, when you do this, uh, you also set that last bit that I didn't talk about before, which is called extra. That's an extra index. And what it means to the indexer is that instead of writing to a single index, now go ahead and write to two indices at the same time. And why this is nice is now because anything that comes after this point, we know is gonna be in both indices. So. From now on, there is no race condition going on in the system. Everything goes to both indices. So what the problem becomes is that 
anything that changed from the moment we started the, butch, uh, the bulk um, indexing to the moment we um, changed to enable double publishing or double writing, that's what we have to reconcile. And that's exactly uh, generation 43, which we have to migrate. So while we're migrating generation 43, obviously stuff will change. So if anything gets updated, we'll have it in both. So it's going to get uh, automatically updated. Um, if it's not updated, and that's the goal of the re-indexing, is find all documents at revision 43 and re-index those documents. So the re-indexing, there's an interesting race condition because uh, when you read the document and then index it again, it may actually have changed, and you don't want to overwrite the previous change. In our case, it's easy to deal with because Cassandra is our source of truth. And um, the way we do our writes into the system, the writes basically get serialized to a single object. So if you're writing to a single object, um, those writes will happen one after the other. So to re-index, we just rewrite those documents. We just rewrite the dummy field. We update a timestamp. And that, that causes those documents to be re-indexed. If you don't have uh, that kind of capability, you can also use Elasticsearch optimistic concurrency control. So you fetch the document, it has a version, and you try to update it uh, given that version number. If, if it fails, you try again, basically. Or actually, you don't even need to try, because if it fails, it means it has been re-indexed. And since you're double writing, you should be fine. So uh, we continue doing this, uh, find all those things. And at some point, we reach what we call a perfect sync between the indices. So now the two indices are the exact same copy. And um, we're still reading from the alias, and the alias is still pointing um, to, to, the current, to the current index. So now what you can do is start some A-B testing on the new index. Uh, there are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, what we do in our case is, is usually uh, we have a separate uh, customer in our production environment that's basically us. And we can only uh, instruct that customer to access the new index. And that's a quick way for us to verify if this index is good or not. Uh, We've, we've actually never seen that it, it ended up being bad, so we, we never had to roll back. But it's, it's, a, good, it's a good kind of confidence test uh, that you do. Another thing that, that we also do is we tee off a portion of our query traffic to the new index. And the reason we do this is that we would like to warm up the caches. So when we switch the indices, uh, we don't have that cold uh, restart moment where everything becomes slow till the caches are, are filled up. So we send a portion of the traffic. We don't care about the results. It's just to warm up the caches. And at some point, what you have to do is you just need to switch the alias from the current index to the new index. And this is, this is kind of the cool moment when you say, I'm going to do it, and everybody is kind of holding um, their stuff and trying to make sure nothing is going gonna, is gonna to burn. Uh, usually, not, usually nothing is more stressful, but nothing, nothing usually burns. And even if something goes bad, you can always switch the index. You can have the inconvenience of impacting some of these queries, but you're not losing any data, which is, which is extremely important. You're still double writing. Um, so once you, you switch and you think the index is good, uh, another step that we do in this case is we bump up the index generation again one more time. And I, I'll, I'll explain why we do that. Uh, we change the current index. So now we stop double writing. We only write to the target index. And the reason we bump up the generation number is it's a backup plan. So if something goes bad and we figure it out three days later, um, instead of having to remigrate again, and when we do that, people are having trouble because of the issue we discovered, what we have to remigrate is stuff that comes after version 45. We know that anything 44 or lower is already in, in the old index, which makes, um, which makes this simple. We honestly never had to do this, and I hope we'll never need to do it, but it's, it's there just in case we need it. So this is all interesting. Um, how do we uh, deal with failures uh, what's, what's, what's involved in this process. So uh, when you're running this at, at, a, at a large scale, things will likely fail. So we'll see nodes uh, go down, for example, um, and things stalling. You will see timeouts, networking issues. And when you're migrating a large number of documents, in our case, we're talking about billions of documents, if something bad happens, after you migrated 95% of your documents, and that already took four or five days, you don't want to restart from scratch. So to deal with that, what we do in our system is we partition our documents. And uh, by partitioning, I mean we take the ID of the document, and we hash that 
into a 64K bucket, uh, into 64 size bucket. So each document is, 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 is hashed into a, a value between uh, zero and 64K minus one. And we use that hash to group documents into buckets. And instead of migrating everything, we just migrate by ranges of buckets. And we usually keep those bucket sizes to about a million. Uh, so we migrate by chunks of a million documents. And this turned out to be extremely useful because if something goes bad, worst case is we have to re-migrate a million documents, which is much better than re-migrating a billion documents. And also, uh, what this does is it, it allows us to use Elasticsearch more, more efficiently. When we do the migration, uh, we have to create a scroll over the data. And when you do a scroll over the data, what you're actually doing behind the scenes, you're doing a consistent um, scanning of the Lucene segments. So what Lucene has to do, it has to keep track of all the, Lucene, all the Lucene segments that you had when you started this scroll so that you get a consistent scroll. So when you have these mergers happening behind the scenes, your segments will not, um, will not be deleted because you're still holding to that file descriptor and the scroll that started at index zero didn't get to that segment yet. That segment is, has document number one billion. So what ends up happening, you're gonna, you're gonna consume storage. In our case, this was mostly fine uh, in most of the cases, uh, but in some cases, this, this, this may be a problem if, if you're doing a lot of merges. For example, if you're deleting all the time and you want to see your data go away, uh, this can be a problem. The other thing that I didn't mention is deletions. Uh, deletion is usually an interesting problem in data systems. Um, the way we, we deal with that is, is just replace the deletion with an update. It's not, it's not a deletion. So anytime we delete a doc, and we, we actually do this only during the migration. Uh, usual time, we just delete stuff, we don't care. But when we do a migration, what we have to do is, instead of deleting the document, we add uh, what we call a deletion marker. And the deletion marker is, replaces the deletion with an update. And then once the migration is done, uh, we have to go and clean up those documents that have the deletion marker. And obviously on the query side, we have to deal with those deletion, document, delete, deletion markers, otherwise we're gonna show documents that have been deleted. So all our queries, uh, query clients will actually automatically filter out um, these documents. Performance is another important aspect uh, for the migration. This is a very heavy operation. Like there is tens of terabytes of data that you're actually moving when you're doing this. So um, the first thing we do is migrating by partition ranges. Already said this, sorry. Um, the second thing we do is, because we don't want to overload the current cluster, um, at some point you're going, to do, you're going to write the two indices, so you're doubling your indexing load. So what we do is we add temporary nodes, and when we create the new index, we can instruct Elasticsearch to place that new index on only those nodes. And that way we can control the load that the migration puts on, on, the target, on the target cluster. This may not work in some cases. If you have a large cluster, you cannot just add more machines. It, it does cost money. Um, if the migration has to take a week to run, that's, that's, that's something you need to take um, into account for, for costing purposes. So um, there are a couple of times where we actually run this on the same cluster. And uh, usually when, you run, when we run it on, on the same cluster, we're a little bit more careful about how we do this. So one important thing that we do on the target index is to completely disable the refreshes. If you're not querying an index, there's no reason to refresh it every second. It's just a waste of CPU and IO. You should just completely disable it. And when you disable it, the speed improvement is huge. Like you're gonna see um, your indexing go from something like a couple thousand to 20,000 or 30,000 indexing operation per second. So it's totally worth it. It makes the first phase of the migration extremely fast. We also start with no replicas. Um, this is a trade-off. It depends how much risk you want to take versus how, how much um, you want this operation to take. If you add replicas, um, in our case, we do quorum indexing, so we require a quorum to respond to synchronously write the data. So when we, when we have replication, it actually slows down the indexing significantly. So we just take the risk and say, um, we don't expect anything to go down. Uh, we just gonna do it without replicas. And then at some point, we'll have to add replicas, obviously, before we switch the production traffic to go to those machines. Um, this worked for us 
um, eight times out of nine. We lost the node one time, and we basically had to restart from scratch, but it was only one time. Um, another thing that we noticed while doing the migration is that when you're doing scroll operation, Elasticsearch by default returns the document in short order. So it's, let's say I've shot zero, one, two, and you, you wanna fetch all documents match, matching some filter, there's no ranking going on. So Elasticsearch, the most efficient way to give you documents is to fetch them first from shard zero, and then from shard one, then from shard two, et cetera. There's no sorting, no ranking, it's very cheap. And the problem with this approach is when you're fetching those, those documents and you have to re-index them again, um, what, what's gonna happen is they're gonna end up exactly on the same shard. You're kind of fetching from one shard and indexing into another shard. And it's exactly the same shard. So when this was happening, when I look at my dashboard, um, what I see is I see three hosts spiking and then that spike is gonna continue and then it, go, it goes down and then a different three hosts go up. And the reason for the number three is because we have one primary and two replicas and they all have the same load. So. Um, this means that we're not utilizing the cluster completely because we're just focusing on three hosts at a time. So there's a very simple solution to this problem. It's just you randomize the results. So what we do, we have a field on our documents that um, allows us to, um, it's, it's, a, it's an updated on uh, timestamp basically, and we just sort the documents by that timestamp. And this was it. Um, I'll take any questions. And uh, you can sign up for a free trial for SignalFX, and please check out our booth. Thank you. <laughs>